Let's go in our Bibles this morning to John chapter 1. We're going to continue in our series uh, that we started a couple weeks ago on unshakable. And there's just a lot to this, so I'm having to kind of use my, my Tuesday nights, my midweek services to kind of fill in the blanks and go into a little bit more in-depth de- teaching. So what we kind of leave off today in this morning service, uh, we'll kind of pick up on Tuesday night and kind of continue with that. So if you're able to be here, of course, we encourage you to be here. If you're not, of course, you can get that uh, service online uh, on Wednesday sometime during the day and uh, catch up with us. Praise God. But it's important that we get these things down and become established in these things in our heart. You know, we, we've been talking about what it takes to be that unshakable person. And that means that you, as a person, are going to have to be anchored to somebody or something that is unshakable. It all has to do with your foundation. It has to do with what you're anchored to. And of course, how do we anchor to a solid, unshakable foundation? Well, there's only one unshakable foundation, and that's the Lord himself. That is the Lord and his kingdom. You remember what we read over in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, at the onset of this series, that it says that we are receiving an unshakable kingdom. See, everything else is going to be shaken, but those who are attached to, anchored to, established in the unshakable kingdom. The unshakable kingdom means that there's nothing out there bigger or stronger. There's no threat to the kingdom of God, (laughs) I can tell you. There's nothing bigger, not anything close to it out there. There's no kingdoms of this world. There's no kingdoms of the darkness of this world that are ever going to be able to really threaten seriously the kingdom of God. And so it requires us to be, if we're going to be unshakable beings, particularly in these uncertain days that we live in, leading up to the soon return of the Lord, there's a lot of things that are going to happen. Of course, Jesus told us there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, pestilences, famines, all those things they're occurring on the earth. So how are we going to establish that unshakable constitution? Well, that means that we're going to have to be anchored to that unshakable entity, the kingdom of God, and that unshakable person, uh, which is the Lord Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father. Well, how do we anchor ourselves to that foundation? Well, so much of it and most of it has to do with what or who we trust in. It has to do with that element of trust. And so we trust, we're all trusting in someone or something anyway. You're not just out there in limbo land, just kind of floating along, and you're not trusting in anything or anybody. You are putting your trust in something or someone. It may be yourself to a large degree. It may be a man's government. It may be a man's institution or a man's invention or a technological thing. And it could be all of those things all tied in at one. We could have trust in multiple things. But it really only comes down to two things. Either you're trusting in God, the Most High God, our Heavenly Father, or you're trusting in man to some degree or some facet or or another. It's one or the other. It's, It's not really complicated. You're either trusting in him or you're trusting in them. Amen. Well, we want to trust in him and not them. But, you know, a lot of people don't realize that they have a choice. They think that they're just having to trust in what we've been given, you know, governments and all that thing, just by default, you know, because there's nothing, you know, there's no one else, nothing else that we can really trust in. And so as goes that entity that we are by default trusting in, so go we. You know, if it gets shaken, we get shaken. If our economy gets shaken, boy, we're all shaken up. If if some kind of pandemic uh, sweeps across the, the, you know, the, the world, then all of a sudden everybody's all shaken up about that. But if you know the one who is unshakable and you're attached by your trust to that thing that is unshakable, then even in those bad times, you're going to maintain your peace. You're going to hold your peace. Because no matter what happens on the earth, it's not bigger than God. And it's not outside of the finished work of Jesus, and it's not bigger than the the, the victory that Jesus wrought for all of us in his death, burial, and resurrection. See, there's nothing out there that's going to really be able to threaten that. All all the enemy can do is extract or separate us away from that 
that thing and that person who is unshakable and getting a, you know, get our, our trust misplaced on something else. And so that's why we're going through this series right here methodically because we need to show you, first of all, you have a choice. <laughs> you don't have to just trust in man. You don't just have to trust in the seen natural realm and things that are you know, in your life. You can trust in the unseen kingdom of God. You can trust in God, even though you can't see him, you can trust in him. You can know him. And see, that's really what boils down to our trust. We trust in who and what we know, what we're familiar with, what we, are, what we actually know intimately. And that's been the problem for the most part is people don't know God or they have misunderstandings about God. Right. And so man-made, man-altered religion has painted a picture and given us a perception of God that is not true, that is, that is misconstrued, that is all twisted up to some degree or another. And see, that's the way the enemy operates. But listen, folks, do not believe the lies of the enemy about God. Don't believe those lies. And sometimes we have to break off from religious man-made philosophies and traditions in order to find out the truth and find out who God really is. Now, I can say this firsthand because I grew up under a lot of that man-altered, originated, you know, it was Christianity, but it was mixed in with a lot of man's philosophies and ideas and interpretations about God and who he was. And it gave me a distorted view of God. It gave me a wrong perception of God. And so I didn't put any trust in him because I was told you never know what God's going to do. Well, you know, that may sound good to a religious person on the Sunday morning, but it, when you're having to face life, when the rubber meets the road Monday through Saturday, amen, or even maybe Sunday afternoon as soon as you leave here, then you're going to have to deal with the fact, who am I going to trust in? A God that I don't know. You never know what he's going to do. He works in mysterious ways. Or am I going to put my trust in God whom I do know? And see, that's where this, this whole church really, and I, my whole ministry is about bringing you into a personal, intimate, close relationship with God. Because that just solves so many problems right there. That just solves so many issues. You know, when we put our trust in God, it's easy to exercise faith. Because the foundation of faith is really trust. See, if I don't trust God, then how am I going to have faith in his word? How am I going to have faith in his power? How am I going to have faith in his love and grace toward me? But see, that's why we have to find out from the word. Let the word be our guide. And let the Holy Spirit on the inside of you paint the right picture of God, of who he really is. Now, I've, I've said this a number of times, and it just bears repeating. It's one of the foundational principles that I teach out of, the way you perceive God will greatly affect how you approach God, how you relate to God, and how you receive from God. See, if you've got a wrong perception of God, it's called deception, then you're going to have wrong reception from God. And if you, if you still believe that God's out in the wild blue yonder just doing his own thing and he doesn't really have time for you, he's not a personal God, but a cold God, you know, that we can't have a personal relationship with, then you're probably going to just by default be on your own. You're going to try to trust in yourself, trust in something else just by default in order to survive. But when you get to know God, that he's a personal God, that if you, when you get to know the heart of God, the heart of our Heavenly Father, then you're going to find out He's out for your good. He's not out for your demise and your destruction. There is one who is out to destroy you. You know, Jesus talked about that. The thief. That's not God, by the way. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, but I've come. In other words, there's a distinction between the thief and me. He said, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Now, here in John chapter 1, have you found that yet? Yep. Let's look at a couple of verses. Actually, we looked at these in more detail a couple of series ago when we talked about the better covenant. We began to distinguish between the old covenant, law of Moses, and the new covenant we live in in Christ. We found out they're completely different, different approach, different relationship, everything. And if you don't, uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, if you're going to join us a little late on that, I'm doing the podcast. This is my inward commercial right here, okay? I'm just going to insert this. I'm in the podcast right now talking about teaching you the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. 
See, you're not all together. We don't live under the old covenant anymore. Now, I know people want to argue about that. But listen, we do not live under the old. God replaced the old. He found fault with it himself. And, why did, and so he, he replaced that with a new and better covenant established on the, uh, the blood of Jesus, the finished work. See, that's what makes this whole covenant better, this new covenant. That's why it's not going to be a, 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 a newer and a better covenant <laughs> coming up down the road is because this is the perfect one. There's no reason. God's not finding fault with this. This is what he wanted all along. It's in place. There's nothing the enemy can do to disrupt it or to, to dilute it in any way or to break it down. It's, it's not going to happen. This is what we live under. And see, for, for the most part, we are living life. Uh, you know, we, we come into the Christian life. We're going to a place called heaven someday when we die. But it has nothing to do with my life now. And so we're teaching still an impersonal God that you can't know, that you can't walk with, that doesn't really care about you. And so we, we bring that over into our daily walk, even as believers, and we're just kind of bumping through life like a pinball machine just trying to survive. Well, that's not the picture that the new covenant paints of God at all. John chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Praise God. Let's get over here before I get off into some rabbit trails here. All right, so it says... Verse 16, uh, it's, uh, actually verse 16 through 18, I should say. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. In other words, what the Greek is actually telling us there is there's a continual flow of grace supplied to us. You're never going to use it up. You didn't use it all up and get into the door of salvation, and then that's it till you get to heaven. No, there's a continual flow. It's grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And it also tells us there's a grace supply for every dimension of need you're going to have. But verse 17 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So again, he makes a distinction between the old covenant law and the new covenant that Jesus brought in full of grace and truth. Now, what did the law present? Well, we found out in Hebrews chapter 12 early, uh, just a couple of weeks ago when we started this series, that we have not come. He's talking to believers here. I'm talking to believers here, okay? We have not come to Mount Sinai where there's smoke and darkness and blackness and all that kind of stuff. And, and even Moses was terrified of and shaken in his sandal, so to speak, of the sight that he saw at Mount Sinai. He said, we've not come to God on Mount Sinai. He says, but we have come to God on Mount Zion. Totally different relationship with God. Now, why is that? Did God just all of a sudden change his mind? Just say, well, we'll just forget all that sin and hell business. You know, I, just, I was just kidding all along. No, he was not doing that at all. Jesus came and paid the price yeah. and absorbed the condemnation and the judgment that was due to all of us. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's not you paying the price for your sin. It was Jesus on the cross paying the price for your sin and condemnation. He absorbed all of our judgment when he was hanging on the cross. He brought it to an end. In fact, the Bible says that God was satisfied with the travail of his soul. He was satisfied. In other words, it satisfied the claims of justice, what God the Father, also the righteous judge, saw on his son on the cross. He poured out all of his wrath, all of the punishment, all the condemnation, all of his anger. He exhausted it all on Jesus on the cross. And that did it. It was done. You do not have to bear up under that any longer. That's why there's such a difference and a distinction between the old covenant law and the new covenant of grace and truth in Christ. See, when they were standing before God at Mount Sinai, they had the law. Of course, God gave them the law, but that law didn't do anything about getting rid of sin in their life. In fact, they were standing before the righteous judge at Mount Sinai as sinners who were guilty and under condemnation. But now we stand before God in Mount Zion. Mount Zion is his house. That's the city of the living God. That's where that innumerable company of angels are. It's the church of the firstborn where our names are registered in heaven. See, that's reason to shout right there, I can tell you. Knowing that you don't have to face God as the righteous judge because of your faith in Jesus. You can now face God the Father as your heavenly Father, amen, as part and members of the household of faith. 
heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You say, well, how can that be? Because of Jesus coming full of grace and truth. See, God did not, he did not uh, just discount and sidestep the justice and the judgment that was due to all of us because of the first Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden leading all the way up to all of ours. God didn't just sidestep it, sweep it under the rug. He dealt with it in truth. But he also gave that to us according to grace. Grace means you didn't do anything to earn it or deserve it. All you did was receive it by faith. Amen. And of course, we're receiving that today. We're receiving the reality of what Jesus did on the cross. When we just receive the communion elements, that's what we are testifying of the fact that we are not under condemnation anymore. God is not remembering your sins anymore. And see, now we can know him in a different way than they knew him. We can approach God in a different approach than, than the Old Testament law of Moses people did. Amen. Amen. Look real quick at Hebrews chapter 8. Now, we looked at this again a couple of series ago in the Better Covenant. But Hebrews chapter uh, 8, just a couple of verses right there. Hebrews chapter 8. And uh, look at verse number 11 and 12. It says, none of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. I want you to see this right there. This is not big I and little you. This is not preacher verses. This is all members of the body of Christ, all who have been washed in the blood, all who have been born again and born of God. He said, notice right here. He said, all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. Now, how are we going to know him? In what light? In verse number 12. He said, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. See, this is how we know God today. This is, you know, I, in fact, Jesus said this in his prayer in John 17, verse 3. He says, this is eternal life that we may know him. Well, how do we know him? Well, we're not talking about knowing about God, knowing facts and figures and things about God. We're talking about knowing him personally, looking beyond just the facts and the figures and the externals and looking down to the internal part of his heart. Having his heart revealed to us. In fact, I think I left off a very important verse in John chapter 1, verse 18. Go back to there real quick. I'm sorry. John chapter 1, verse 18. I get the rocking and rolling and we just roll on. All right. So verse 18, it says, no one has seen God at any time. Up until that point, he's talking about people. He's talking to and about people who are under the Mosaic law. He said, none of them have seen God at any time. Yes, Moses saw the back parts of God. He saw glimpses into the heart of God. David saw glimpses into the heart of God. In fact, God said about him, he says, he's a man after my own heart. We talked about some of those Psalms last week of what he saw into the heart of God. But nobody actually fully saw who the Father's heart was all about. But notice, he said, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Now, I like the Amplified Version uh, verse number uh, 18. So I'm going to read the Amplified of verse 18 real quick. It's a little longer, but it's okay. It says, no man has ever seen God at any time. The only unique son or the only begotten God who is in the bosom, in the intimate presence of the Father, he has declared him. Now listen to this. He has revealed him. He has brought him out where he can be seen. He has interpreted him and he has made him known. So if we really want to know the heart of God, we have to look at Jesus. The Bible says he is the perfect expression of the Father. Philip, one of the disciples, asked Jesus one day, he said, show us the Father and it's sufficient for us. And so Jesus turned around and said, wait a minute. Have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father also. In other words, all the things that Jesus said, taught, preached, and did and demonstrated in their midst. All the miracles showed us something about the heart of God. 
When he healed all the multitudes, that showed us about the heart of God. When he was teaching all those tremendous, awesome teachings that he did, he was teaching and revealing and pulling God out so he could be known and so he can be seen. See, God reserved throughout all the ages the revelation of his heart until Jesus came. And see, when Jesus came, that's the first place first expression of the full heart of God that we've ever seen in the earth since the fall of uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And you know, all those things, don't let just miracles just say, man, ooh and ah, but you miss the revelation of the miracle. See, God does miracles in our midst. He does awesome things in our midst. Is it just so we can, you know, have goosebumps, double parked on goosebumps and walk away and say, boy, that was really good today. You should see something about the heart of God in every miracle. See, within every miracle, there's a heart behind that. There's a heart of love and mercy and grace and goodness behind that. And see, you need to see that that is your heavenly father. See, Jesus taught on these things over and over again. This is what made the, or the Pharisees and the Sadducees all mad at him. Because he would pull God out into a place where you can have a personal relationship with him. They didn't mind serving God through cold stone tablets. You know, trying to do works and really not really know God. But when Jesus pulled him out and said, this is how the Father loves you. This is the Father's heart towards you. This is the, and he did miracles. Then they, they despised him for that. Now, look over to Matthew's gospel, chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Because we're going to teach about some today and probably on Tuesday night as well. We're going to look at some of the things that Jesus both taught and did that show us the heart of, heart of our Father. Now, why is that? It's so that you can know Him. Because you cannot trust in somebody you don't personally know. You cannot you cannot put your full trust in somebody who you do not realize and know that they're worthy of your trust. Amen. They're trustworthy. I can tell you the more I know God, the more trustworthy I know He is. That He's, he's out for our good. He always has your good at His heart. He has good intentions toward you. Now, He showed that even in the law. You know, the law pointed out us to us. It revealed us to us, but it also revealed the mercy and the grace of God in those sacrifices that he allowed somebody else to stand in your place and die on your behalf so that you wouldn't have to. See, that is a display and a revelation of the goodness and the grace of God. All those types and shadows about Jesus were all things, truths about our Heavenly Father and about the heart of God toward us that we need to know in order to trust in Him. Now here in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, now there are some tremendous things that Jesus taught here in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But we want to talk about some of these things because these have to do with knowing God and trusting God, even in our daily life. Yes, you can trust in God in your daily life. Now, notice here, verse 25. He says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? All right, now, look real quick. He's telling us not to worry about our life. Now, the word worry is really an old English word word that actually means to strangle. So in other words, when you're worrying, you're strangling the very source of supply and its flow that's coming to your life. Now, why would you be worrying for? You're worrying because you've got misplaced focus and misplaced trust. You're looking at something else to be God and provider and source in your life that you have no business looking to. You have no business trusting in. Amen. Now, I know in, on our money we have in God we trust, but for the most part, we're, we're actually trusting in the money and not the God that we trust in. And again, it's because we've been taught wrong and we've been taught things about God that were distorted, particularly in the financial material area. Even in church circles, people 
believe that God won't, he don't want to have anything to do with your material possessions. But listen, God created you a physical being. And because you're a physical being, you have physical needs. Anybody know that? Most people spend most of their time trying to meet those needs, trying to get those needs met one way or another. But see, when we get our trust on the right source, God is our source for everything. See, people can be trusting in God being their source for salvation, eternal salvation, but they don't know that God really cares about them as far as their uh, physical needs being met. Listen, God not only wants to meet your needs, He wants to meet them so abundantly, you got more in store and have so much, you're going to have to go give it away somewhere. See, if you don't see God that way, if you don't see God as being generous, see, we've, uh, we've attached and attributed to God uh, just a lot of human nature characteristics. We're trying to interpret God and see Him in light of humanity. God's not a fallen being like we are. He didn't have a wrong nature and a wrong spirit on the inside of him. In fact, God never changed when man fell. Man fell, he needed to be born again. God did not need to be born again. And when God put man in the Garden of Eden, what did he put him in the middle of? He put him in the middle of abundant provision. Man, there's so many apples and oranges and grapes and bananas out there, he couldn't eat them. There's more than enough. They're falling off the tree and rotten. He said, well, God's, you know, God's not wasteful. No, but he's extravagant. He wants to show you how generous he is and how good he is. Listen, he wouldn't create the universe and all his splendor and glory and, and magnificence only to create, put man in a little boxed-off corral with a couple of shrubs, and he's barely getting along, and he looks emaciated half the time. That's not the way God is. If you got that idea about God, if you've been taught of that about God, you need to go into the Word of God and let the Holy Ghost paint a different picture for you. Amen. He meets your needs according to His riches. His riches. I say His riches. Not His scarcity in glory. Not His rationing in glory. Not according to shortages in glory. You're not going to go to God and ask Him for something. He said, well, we're having a hard time meeting our needs this month and making men, you know, ends meet. So, you know, come back next month. Maybe I can give you something. No, that is not the Heavenly Father. That's not God at all. God wants to give you so much that He can support your addiction to giving and being generous yourself. Amen. He's looking for people who will be distributors, not hoarders. Hoarders are people who, out of fear, hoard up things because they're expecting some rainy day and they're going to have to gather more in, build bigger barns, because God may not be enough for next year and, you know, five years from now. Listen, the God who has been enough will always be enough. Amen. His kingdom is never going to run out. That's right. If the economy of this world goes southwest, north, however you want to put it, we'll pick on the people out west. It goes west, all right, this time. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> then what happens? Well, my, my source is not down here on the earth anyway. My kingdom, the, the, my kingdom provision is according to God's kingdom, not according to this stuff down here. See, we're all going to need to know this. What happens when you hear of wars, rumors of wars, and famines and pestilences and all those kind of things? What, what's going to happen when you start hearing about those things? Are you going to start gathering up more stuff? Well, there's nothing wrong with gathering up. If the Lord has you do that, if the Lord leads you to do that, but if you're doing it out of fear, a motivation of worry and fear and insecurity, well, let me tell you something, you're going to lose everything you got because the enemy's got you there because you're in a place, you're in a place where you're not trusting the Lord. We don't know what's going to happen in the next few years. We, we have no idea. But I do know this. God is still going to be around. He's still going to be my father. He's not falling off the throne anytime soon. His kingdom's not going under. Amen. His kingdom's not going to file bankruptcy. Hallelujah. So Jesus is telling us, you've got misplaced trust. So he says, I say to you, do not worry about your life. For what you will eat or what you will drink, 
nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Now, he's not telling us right here that these things aren't important. He's not telling us that at all. He's telling us there's more to life than you just spending all your time and focus and attention on trying to provide for yourself and making you the God of your life. You make a lousy God. I'm sorry, but there you'd make a lousy God. Amen. And the faster you find out that there is a God and I'm not him, is the faster you're going to get on, on his program and under, under his system. What is life about? What is Jesus try, trying to teach us right here? Life is about him. It's, a, it's about God. It's about the kingdom of God. It's not about the daily grind. It's not about the rat race. Listen, even if you win the rat race, you're still the number one rat, I can tell you. <laughs> so it's not about the rat race or the daily grind. It's not about you toiling and striving and stressing out, trying to get your provision made and trying to get your needs met. It's about you walking with God. It's about you centering your life on Him. It's about putting your focus and your trust on him and him alone. This is what brings, gets the worry out and brings the peace and the rest in right in the middle of you working. He's not telling you not to work. He's just not telling, he's telling you not to work with stress and strife. You're not, you're not working under the motivation that, that if I don't produce, I'm going under. If I don't provide my own needs, then who's going to provide them? God will. That's what he's telling you right here. He's telling you to chill out and let God be God of your life. Amen. All right, now look at verse 26. He says, look at the birds of the air. Consider the birds. That's easy to do, isn't it? He was outside. He was teaching this on the Sermon on the Mount. There were probably birds flying around. He said, look at the birds. Consider them. He said, for they neither... Sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He said, are you not of more value than they? Now, this one verse here tells us three important things about God that you need to know to put your trust in. First of all, and we all know this because religion has really emphasized this above the other two. But the first thing you need to know is God is able God is able to take care of all of your needs. Now listen, he's not talking about a bird in a cage. He's talking about all the birds of the air. Now, I heard one time many years ago, don't know if this is true or not, but I, I would say it's probably, probably true, that of all the, you know, there's a lot of money in Texas, a lot of millionaires, billionaires out there, but there's no one out there in Texas who has enough money that they could feed all the birds in Texas. But God can and does. He's telling you that there is abundant provision from your heavenly Father in, in the kingdom of God to take care of all of your needs, every bit of them. So number one, we're talking about God's ability. But if that's all you ever knew, well, thank God for that. But, you know, religion has come back and they say, well, God is able. God is able, God is able, God is able. But they leave it right there. But you need to know that God is not only has the ability and the resources to take care of you in grand style. He's also gracious enough and willing enough to expend his ability, resources, and goods in heaven on your behalf, even though you didn't deserve it or earn it. That this is how gracious our Father is. What are we doing now? Well, we're going out from just the ability of God, anybody can believe that, down into the heart of God. What is he going to do with the stuff he's got? Is he going to hoard it up? Is he going to withhold it? See, that's what religion has told us. God withholds. He's going to take it back. He's going to withhold something from you in order to deepen your piety and, you know, and, and make your relationship better with him. Listen, if he's withholding, that's not going to draw me closer to him. That's going to make me suspicious about him. And that's what religion has done. Undertones, undercurrents has brought a suspicion about God that he withholds. He's got it. Boy, he's got streets of gold. He's got all this stuff, cattle on a thousand hills. But I tell you, he's not going to share it with you. He needs to forget it. Amen. But he's telling us right there that he 
will share with you. He is willing. He is gracious. Amen. Glory to God. But he's also telling us something else here. And this is the big question that all of us have to answer in our heart. Look, look at the question Jesus posed at the end of that verse. He said, after looking at the birds of the air, how they neither sow nor reap, gather into barns, all that stuff, your, hev your heavenly father, I want you to see that first, your heavenly father. So he brings it down to personal level. He didn't say the God of the universe. He said, your heavenly father feeds the birds. Now notice, he said, are you not of more value than they? So you have to answer that question. Are you not of more value than the birds? Some people would say no. Some people in their own heart disqualify themselves. They do not think they're very valuable to God at all. They're expendable. They're, they're, they're basically an accident that just kind of occurred. Listen, there are no accidents. God knew every single person that was going to be born on the face of the earth, his foreknowledge. Before Adam and Eve were created, he knew every one of you. He knew when you were going to be born. He knew where you were going to live. He knew your life experience, your address, everything. He knows all about you. He knows everything about you. Are you valuable to him? Are you more valuable than the birds? Amen. Well, the government would tell you, no, the spotted owl is a lot more valuable than you. Well, that's, that's not true. Amen. Jesus didn't come to give his life for the spotted owls. Or the sperm whales or whatever else is out there. He came, listen, all those endangered species. Listen, he came to, to re, uh, redeem your life, to purchase your freedom with his, his blood. And God didn't sin. Listen, how do we know how much God values us? How do we know what kind of worth that God places on us? You have to look at the price that he paid to purchase your redemption. See, the enemy's always in people's ear. Tell them how worthless they are. Well, if I am that worthless, then why did God, the original Jew, pay such a high price for my redemption? book of Isaiah prophesies about Jesus coming. He said that he's actually a double payment for our sin. God knew exactly how much it would take to redeem you, to purchase your freedom, and yet he sent Jesus as an overpayment. Why? Because he wants you to know how, worth, how much worth and value you are to him. See, he didn't send an angel down here. He didn't chunk off a piece, uh, you know, piece of gold out of the street and send it down here. We just read it over when we were receiving communion. That we were not, our freedom, our redemption was not purchased with silver and gold corruptible stuff. Or by the traditions of your father, but by the precious blood of Jesus himself, the son of the living God. See, that begins to paint the right picture now of how God values you how much worth you are in his eyes. See, it's not, really, it's not really the value you place on yourself or the value, the worth that somebody else places on you. See, society will say you're insignificant, you're no good, you're worth nothing. You're, you're, you have no value because you didn't do this and you didn't do that and your name's not this and you don't have this much money and all that kind of stuff. See, they, they place value on those things. But that's not the way God sees it at all. See, God looks at you. That's what it matters. My trust in God is according to the value that he places on me. See, the, the people that are going to have the most impact of your life are not just the people you personally believe in, but the people that believe in you. That is what, in, in other words, they value you. There's, there, those are the people that are going to have the most impact and influence in your life. Yes, you believe in them, but they also believe or place a worth and a value in you personally. And see, God the Father, he places the highest premium on you. He saw if you were the only one 
that ever would receive Jesus and be born again, God wants you to know he sent his son to redeem you. See, there was no guarantee that anybody was even going to be, receive Jesus and be born again. But he knew that love was going to win the day. He knew that it, the Holy Spirit would be able to reveal the value and the worth to people that he places on you, not that the world places on you. Now, you know, Psalm 8 talks about, you know, I used to read this in a negative light. In fact, when I was growing up, this was always kind of a harsh, you know, psalm that says, when I consider the heavens and the earth, the stars and the moon, all the stuff that you've made, he said, what is man that you're mindful of him or the son of man that you visit him? We were always, you know, kind of in the light and we were always taught according to that psalm that, you know, God's got a big universe out here. Who are you? You know, you're just insignificant. You're just a speck on all eternity. You're just a speck. That's actually teaching quite the opposite. This is telling us the true value that God places on you, that God in all his vast creation, and listen, there is bigger solar systems out there. There's a lot bigger planets out there than the one we live on. But you know what? God chose to focus on you, a speck on eternity on earth. He chose to value you. He chose to love you. He chose to put his good plan in motion for you. This is how he looks at you. Now, see, people will argue with you all the time and say, well, that's, you know, I just don't see it that way. Well, I'm telling you, those kind of people, I've met tons of them. All grew up under the same religion I did. And they have no personal relationship with God. And listen, I get around them and there's no peace in their life either. No peace. Because, listen, if you have that real distant, far off, far, you know, long distant relationship with God, you just call him on holidays every once in a while. You know, you don't have much contact because you don't think he really values you. So you just kind of keep your distance away from him. Then there's going to be no peace in your life. No peace. But I tell you, when you hang around God, there's going to be peace and joy, unspeakable and full of glory. The Bible says that in his presence, Psalm 16, in his presence, his fullness of joy. People get that stern, worried look on their face. You know they hadn't been in the presence of God. They've been in the presence of somebody else, but not in the presence of God. Because when you spend time in the presence of God, you're at rest. You're at peace. You're chilling out because you know your heavenly father's got it. No matter what you're going through, no matter how big the problem is, how big the need is, you know God, your heavenly father, has got it. Amen. You know, over in Luke's gospel, chapter 12, he was talking about this same thing. This is the same uh, narrative here. But Luke brings some, a couple of verses out. We're, you know, we're talking about considering the birds. You know, if we're considering the birds and finding out our value, if God feeds all them faithfully, how much more is he going to value you and take care of your stuff? But here in Luke's gospel, chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, he said, are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? In other words, they're pennies. I mean, they're worth basically nothing. According to the world, they're insignificant. He said, five sparrows sold for two copper coins, and not one of them is forgotten before God. Not one of them. In other words, God remembers all the birds, every one of them. They may be worthless according to the world. They, you know, you may get five of them for two, uh, for two pennies. I guess inflation hadn't hit at that point, you know. <laughs> but, you know, they, they were worth basically nothing. But he said, the father, he's not forgotten one of them. Not a one of them. Not one single bird. He says, verse 7, but the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Somebody brought out one day that actually that word numbered should be named. He's named every one of the hairs on your head. I got a name for this one and a name for that one. One just fell out in the brush. His name, I don't know, but he's going back in, all right? <laughs> Amen. Anybody know the number of hairs on your head? Anybody know that? Now listen, God the Father values you more than you, you 
value yourself. If you're living according to self-love, you're coming up short. You're selling yourself short. You need to trust in the living God who loves you infinitely, unconditionally, aggressively, just over the top. He's got you on his mind all the time. He says he engrafts you or tattoos you in the palm of his hand. In other words, all his name. Somebody said it this way. I like this. He said if you were to see God's refrigerator, your picture would be up there on it. Yep. And your picture would be in his wallet. God's got a big wallet, doesn't he? Your picture would be in there. See, this is the way God values you. Everything's significant. A lot of people think, well, God, I'm not, I'm not going to bother him. He's out taking care of the universe. He doesn't need to be bothered with my petty needs. Psalm 138 says he, can, he perfects that which concerns me. In other words, if it concerns you, it's a concern to him. If it's your need, it's his need. And he's supplied for it. He has looked down the corridors of time and saw every need that you're ever going to have, spirit, soul, body, any part of your life. And listen, he has already made provision for that. We looked at it last week, Psalm 31, verse 19. It says, oh, remember that? You know, there's a cereal out there that says honey bunches of O's. Well, we got honey bunches of O's for breakfast every morning. It says, oh, how great is your goodness which you have laid up or stored up for those who trust in you. In other words, when we trust in God, that connects us with our source and his supply for us. And what does that do? Well, all the goods that you're ever going to need in life, all that provision is already stored up, prepared for you who trust in him. In other words, there's not something he did not foresee. You know, you're going to go to God, well, I didn't see that coming. He knew exactly what you are going to need in life, not just for your personal provision, but listen, to fulfill the purpose and the plan of God for your life, which always includes other people. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So in other words, God wants to bring his storehouse and make you a distribution center Thank you, Lord. of his goodness being displayed in all the earth. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. See, we're now teaching about the heart of God. This is what is going to cause you to have the right perception of God so you can make him trustworthy in your life. You can trust in the living God. See, the reason people act dumb the way they do is because they're not trusting God. They're stressed and stri they have so much strife and stress in their life. No peace because they're looking to themselves to provide all the demands of life and all the needs of life. But when I'm trusting in the living God and I'm at rest, then I can, I can chill out and I can walk in peace. Amen. Amen. I don't have to get what everybody else has got because my Father has more in store for me. Amen. This will cut out a lot of strife and stress in our own nation right now. People are so self-focused, so self-dependent and self-indulged that they think if somebody else gets something, that's going to be less for me not true because we're all operating in the same kingdom right. we all have the same kingdom provision for us amen all right let's go back over to matthew 6 i'm gonna have to kind of close it up somewhere here matthew chapter 6 and i'll pick it up on tuesday night but notice this in verse number 27 he says which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature which of you by worrying can add one cubit. You know why people worry? You know why they're anxious? You know why they're fearful about stuff? Because they've misplaced their trust in a wrong source. And that wrong source is limited in its ability to provide their needs. That could be self. That could be government. That could be an institution, a financial institution. That could be anything and everything. But anytime we get our trust in the wrong source, then we're going to open ourselves up to worry. You know why we're worrying and fearful and anxious? Because we know what we're trusting in is limited. So why are we putting our trust in something that's limited that can't meet your needs anyway when we have a Heavenly Father who's fully able and willing to meet all your needs, to take care of your whole life? See, what Jesus is teaching us right here is get off the world system by not trusting in them and switch systems over. Get over into the system of the kingdom of God that has full provision and more than enough. Amen. 
Now listen, your worrying is not going to help anyway. Worrying is not going to make any more production for you, any more supply for you. You're just spending all your time and your energy. You're just exhausting your inward energy and strength trying to think about and worry about something that your Heavenly Father is already taking care of for you. Now look at verse 28. He said, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spend. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not rayed like one of these. Now notice it says Solomon in all his glory. In all his glory. See, what God wants to do is clothe you in his glory. He, wants, he can clothe you better. And really, it's not just about physical clothes. That's not just what he's talking about. See, the animals, the birds, the lilies, they're all clothed from the inside out. The Bible tells us to put on the garments of praise. Gee, you wear, you wear what's on the inside of you externally. You wear the presence of God. You wear his peace. You wear his joy. You wear him. He's given you clothes, the robe of righteousness. There's just something about that. When you're arrayed with that, even though, you know, externally your clothing, you may have a Braves t-shirt on. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm a world champion in him. Amen. I'm valued. I'm at peace. I'm exercising joy. People get around you. They, they don't even know what it is. They just know there's something about you. I tell you, I can get around people all the time. I can find out pretty quick what they're wearing, what's on the inside of them, because they wear it on the outside. You ever heard that saying, don't wear your feelings out in your, on your sleeves? Well, that's where a lot of people are. They're wearing everything out on their outward person. You see them stressed out, full of strife, worried, anxious, fearful. Those are not good clothes, I can tell you. But when you put on his stuff that he's prepared for you, it looks a lot better. People, you know, even kids, they want to be around Jesus all the time, didn't they? They'd line up to get, you know, get close to Jesus. You know, kids are, you can't fool them. You know, they're not hypocritical. So they have to learn that. They weren't going to hang around somebody who's full of anger all the time. Short. Tell them to get away. You know, the disciples told them to send the kids away, and Jesus said, bring them in here. Let me bless them. Amen. Well, adults are more important. Who said? Amen. Your children need to be brought up to understand your, their value to God because that's going to cause them when they get on their own, they leave your nest to be able to trust in the living God because he's going to take care of us. He'll take care of us. I don't have to worry about it. God's going to take care of us. Amen. Glory to God. I'm going to have to pick it up on Tuesday. Man, I've got a lot of stuff for Tuesday. Thank you, Lord. But I wanted to paint the right picture. Get us off of that religious distortion deception, lies that it painted our Heavenly Father as old stingy, creepy, <laughs> condemning, angry person. Couldn't be anything further from the truth. Amen. Again, it's men trying to interpret God based on their humanity. God is not a man. He's not a man. He doesn't operate like we do. Amen. He doesn't see things the way we see them. It'd be better for us to see things the way he sees them. Because that's in truth. That's the light. Amen. That he wants us to walk in. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody stand up. Praise God. Let's just close our eyes, lift our hands just a minute. Let's just acknowledge our Heavenly Father. See, religion always wants to refer to him as God. But the spirit of sonship on the inside of you always cries out, Abba, Father. 
And that's not just a biological offspring type of father. That's daddy. That's somebody who has taken a responsibility for you to take care of your needs, to value you, to put a, a worth on you. Glory to God. Father, we're so thankful. You're so good. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that you are showing us, revealing to us your goodness, your love for us, your graciousness, your mercy. That, Lord, now we come to Mount Zion to know you intimately, the way Jesus presented him, to know you personally, to know what's in your heart towards us. The natural response when we get to know you is just to trust in you, to be able to lean on you, to be able to com just submit our entire life unto you because you've always been out for our good. Like Sarah, we consider you faithful. We consider you faithful, Lord. You are faithful. It's your faithfulness, Lord, that we lean entirely our whole life and being on. No nothing else. Nothing else. Not anything man-made, no government institution, nothing. We lean on the living God. We trust in you, Lord, with all of our heart and lean not to our own understanding. In all of our ways, we acknowledge you and you direct our paths. We willfully submit to you and your lordship over our life and your provision in our life. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to show you on Tuesday how this opens up everything. See, a lot of people, they've been seeking healing in their physical body, but they're missing this one thing right here. That right view of God, perception of God, that he'll take care of everything. I don't care what it is. Listen, if you're in here today and you've you got a pressing need, I want you to know that your Heavenly Father knows that need and already has made provision for it. What he, what he is asking you to do is something tough on your mind and flesh and maybe against your tradition of worrying. And He wants you to just roll it over on Him and trust Him. He wants you to be able to put all of your cares over on Him for He cares for us. He cares about you. He watches over you. You can even commit your life to him, knowing that he has a good plan in store for you. Amen. And you can just enter into this season of stress and rest. Glory to God. Somebody said one time, they figured this out. I don't know how. They must have more time than I do. But if you, uh, if you spell stressed backwards, it turns out to be desserts. What does that have to do with anything? Because Jesus gave you desserts, amen? Rather than being stressed, you can eat at the Lord's tables, amen? <laughs> amen? The Lord's table, there's good stuff, amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What is desserts in the, in the spiritual realm? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord in his presence always. You know, while the world's going through their stress and while the world's going through all their maneuvers, you can just enter into that secret place of the Most High. You can just live in his presence. Even in the middle of stressful environments and stressful surroundings, you can just enter into the peace of God and the presence of God and the joy of the Lord. I tell you what, you're being strengthened and refreshed while everybody else is coming unglued. While they're putting a stranglehold on the supply of the Spirit, you're opening it up and saying, man, just, just pour it. Pour it on me, Lord. The Bible says there's times of refreshing coming from the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's not that God just shows up and then leaves. It's the fact that you become conscious and aware of his presence always. See, that's what worship does. When you're putting on the garments of praise, you're focusing on you know, becoming conscious 
of the Lord's presence, of his refreshing. Let's do that right now. Just close your eyes. Because the Lord wants to refresh you today. Some of y'all have been through, through the ringer. Amen. And there are seasons in life where there's just more stress than others. And there's things you have to deal with. But you can always come back to home base. You can lift your hands and begin to praise Him that He is good and His mercy endures forever. Begin to focus on Him and receive that fresh cascade of His presence, of His refreshment pouring over you continuously. You may have been through some battles, but the Lord restores your soul by bringing refreshment into your life. Fresh peace, fresh joy, fresh strength from heaven. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you, Lord, right now. We just worship you and magnify you for you are good and your mercy endures forever. Thank you, Lord, that in your presence there's fullness of joy. We can live in this place. Have days of heaven on the earth knowing that you're with us, that you're among us. You've already taken care of stuff. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We just worship you and magnify you. We glorify you. Oh, we lift you up, Lord. You are so good. Such a good father. Such a good, good father. So good. What manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. Oh, that we be called your children and heirs. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you're faithful today. We magnify you above the problem. You are the solution. You are our source. You're above it all. You ma we magnify and glorify you above every bit of it. All of it. Knowing that you're our source of life. Life is more than the daily grind of, of provision. Life is about you. Life is centered on you. Life is receiving from you. Life with you is peace. Life with you is joy. Life with you is rejoicing. Hallelujah. Life with you is strengthening. Glory to God. Strengthening right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Well, how's the Lord going to work that out? You just leave it to Him. You don't have to worry about how He's going to do it. You just need to know who's going to do it. Amen. You focus on the who, He'll focus on the how. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It's a working, praise God, working in us, working among us today. Thank you, Lord. See, there is no restoration going to be manifested in your life without rest. Entering into rest opens the door for restoration. Hallelujah. Restoration. I'm talking about every part of your life. When you enter into that rest of just trusting your heavenly Father, oh, that He's good. Amen. That His goodness far outweighs the evil surrounding you, facing you right now. Whatever battle you're facing, it's bigger than you. But whatever battle you're facing is not bigger than God. Amen. Your heavenly Father, you stand behind Him. Amen. That's what gives you courage to move forward. Not just crawl up in a fetal position in the corner. Cry your eyes out. But you, you stand up. You're strong in Him. Courageous and brave in Him. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Even the old two lepers in the Old Testament had that revelation. He said, why are we, we going to sit here until we die? We just sit here, we're going to die. If we, you know, maybe we'll, we'll find something. Well, when they entered in, when they started marching out, trusting in the Lord in courage, they went down there and found the enemy's camp all, all vacant. They still have barbecue cooking. Amen. They still had beans on the stove. And they said everybody just vacated. It's because God calls their footsteps to sound like a whole army and it scared them all off because God went down there before they did. Amen. We're not just going to sit here till we die. We're not here just to by our time do we go to heaven. Amen. We're to be strong and courageous. 
and walk in his presence. See, that's what's going to make the difference. It's not what you can do and what you can say. It's about him, what he can do. The anointing flows through rest. Amen. I found that a long time ago. That if I'm looking for a message to preach, it's hard-nosed and it doesn't come. But when I just rest, there it is. It's easy. Easy. Amen. All right. Y'all receiving today. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead, John. Come on, can we lift up our hands one more time? Thank you, Lord. Do as the psalmist said. Put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. We can just praise our God even in the midst of obstacles and challenges because we know He's faithful. Because we know He's good. Our Father is faithful. You stick closer than a brother, Jesus. You're always there for us. You uplift us. You sustain us. You cause us to overcome. You cause us to triumph, Jesus. And we fix our eyes over on you. We look to you and call you faithful. We acknowledge your faithfulness. We acknowledge your presence. We acknowledge the reign of our King Jesus over every single issue, over every sickness, over every disease, over every virus, over every bit of lack or poverty of any kind. And we speak God's shalom peace, God's wholeness, God's completeness in every single area of our life, even the minor details, Father. You you take care of everything. You take care of everything. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's like what the Apostle Paul said. Be of good courage. It shall be just as it was spoken to me. So even in the midst of things going haywire, maybe things are slightly chaotic, you can be at perfect rest. You can be in perfect peace, holding on, grasping on to God's Word because you know it's going to be exactly as He told you it was going to be. It shall be just as God said, not just as somebody else told me it was going to be, not just as though what other people are analyzing the problem to be. It shall be just as God said. This is God's word. This is God's decree. Everywhere we look, we see nothing but blessings. Amen. Praise God. You guys can be seated this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Why is it important to come to church? Because of times and moments like that. Yeah, you can have that on your own, but there's something so special about coming into a body of believers under that corporate anointing and just allowing the Spirit of God and the presence of God to move in and through us, among us, to encourage us, to refresh us. Amen. Praise God. If you need an offering envelope, they're located right in front of you this morning. Or if you'd like to give online, you can go onto our website, church316.org. You can select the Give option. And you can just follow the instructions on the screen, or you can create a profile, and then you can set up reoccurring gifts. You can do all these sorts of things. Or if it's easier for you, rather than going to the website, you can text 316-GIVE, that's 316-G-I-V-E, to 1-888-364-4483, and a a link will be sent right to your phone where you'll be able to give online. And we appreciate everybody's faithful support and generosity here at Church 316 because we as a group of believers believe in the gospel. We believe in what the Word can do for people. And it's important for us to get the Word out to others, to those who have never heard it, to those who are still in bondage. The the, the Word of God frees every bit of it. The Spirit of God frees every bit of it. And that's why we give, because we believe in that Word. We believe in the Spirit of God and what He can do. Amen. When He's given an open door, there is no limit, there is no impossibility to the power of God. Amen. Our offering scripture this morning is found in Romans chapter 8. Man, these are some of my favorites. This is, this is from the Passion Translation. It says, so what does all of this mean? If God has, disturb, has determined to stand with us, tell me, who then could ever stand against us? For God has proven His love by giving us His greatest treasure, the gift of His Son. And since God freely offered him up as the sacrifice for us all, he certainly, I like that word, he certainly won't withhold from us anything else he has to give. 
Everything God has to give, He has freely given it to you already. Amen? This is why we can be calm. This is why we can be settled. This is why we can be at rest. Because we know the faithful God is faithful to provide every need in our life. Amen? Praise God right where you are. God loves a cheerful giver. This is a moment of worship between you and your heavenly Father. Let's hold our offerings up before the Lord. Father, thank you so much for being so faithful. God, thank you for not withholding anything. Thank you for being so open for us and giving us all things that pertain to life and godliness. God, we are a people who abound in thanksgiving. Our hearts overflow with gratitude, and we just say thank you, Lord. Thank you for providing for us. Thank you for taking care of us. Father, thank you for providing all of our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And Father, we give this morning with faith-filled, expectant hearts. Lord, we're expecting a harvest off of this seed. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Lord, we are not running out. But we declare this by faith boldly in Jesus' name that we are running over. We always have abundance in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Well, the buckets are on the way this morning. Make sure that you guys get your tickets for the Christmas party in the back. This is one of my favorite times of the year. So you can see Katie right in the back after service, and she'll be happy to get tickets for you and your family. Amen. Praise God. We love y'all so much. We'll see y'all Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Go and have a blessed afternoon. Amen and amen.